great to see you. Welcome to you, Middletown, Newburgh, Port Jervis, Warwick. Love you. Thank you for being with us, everybody online, and of course, everybody right here in this room. Such a joy to have you. If you're a guest, I am Jared. I have the joy of getting to be the senior pastor of these wonderful folk known as Grace Community Church. And as a guest, we offer what we uh, call the three hugs of grace every weekend to you. And one is that you are a gift to us, truly. Thank you for being here. And then secondly is that you're okay not to be okay. You don't have to put on any kind of mask or play a Christian. No, you just be you. But we hope, we don't, we hope you don't want to stay in that not okay place. And then thirdly is that we love you enough to tell you the truth. And that capital T truth is Jesus. And it's also the scriptures from Genesis to Revelation, all of it for your life. So thrilled you're here. Let me mention one thing about the men's ministry, the, the men's conference coming. Young men, old men, middle-aged men, you got to be here. You got to be here for this conference. We're going to have it at all of our locations. We're going to uh, simulcast it. And I have the joy of getting to spend three sessions with you on teaching on work and what is work and I hate my work or I love my work or calling. And we're going to deal with all of that. So I hope you'll sign up and join us. But today, we got some revelation. Are you ready for some of this? Okay, one of you are. I hope your campuses are ready and everybody online. I'll just look at you the whole time, all right? Let's pray together. We'll dig in. Lord, thank you for all who are here, and we need you, Holy Spirit. So help your servant speak through the scriptures and open our hearts to your word, your word to our hearts. We plead it in Jesus' name, amen. I'm willing to think that if I went to each campus today or maybe surveyed you online, or went around this whole room right here and asked you, what do you think Revelation in the Bible, Revelation is all about? I would think probably almost everyone would say it's all about the end times. But what if I told you that you're wrong, that Revelation is not all about the end times? So think of it with me like this. Think of it in terms of a puzzle. This is my daughter Jubilee's puzzle. Do not tell her I took her beloved puzzle, all right? But let's take a puzzle. So you have a puzzle, and you have the picture on the box. So then you have the individual pieces. So with these individual pieces, uh, when you think of a puzzle, it's, it's not about each individual piece of the puzzle. It's about the picture that comes together when you put all the pieces together. It's about focusing what's on the picture on the box and how all the pieces fit. So revelation. What tends to happen with revelation is people go to the, to the letter, and it's a letter, not a book. They go to the letter, and you concentrate on one piece or a couple of pieces, the big pieces. And no wonder that can bring fear. No wonder that can bring confusion because revelation is not all about the pieces. Revelation is all about Jesus Christ. Christ. It's all about him. And in him, all the pieces come together. Are you with me? So watch this. Let's just jump right in. Revelation chapter one, verse one, the revelation of Jesus Christ. John just told us in his introduction what revelation is all about. It's all about Jesus Christ. We're only four words in the 22 chapters of a letter. And he says it's all about Jesus Christ. And notice it doesn't say revelations. It's only one revelation, and it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. Jesus is in chapter 1. Jesus is in chapter 22. He's in the beginning, and he's in the end. It's all about Jesus. This word revelation literally means apocalypse. Now, what do you think of when you hear the word apocalypse? Most likely you think of cataclysm, a catastrophe. I know at the Jones house, at our house, whenever we hear the big snows coming, we call it a snowpocalypse because everything is coming. It's a cataclysm of snow. And people think that's what apocalypse means. That's not what apocalypse means. The apocalypse of Jesus Christ means the unveiling of Jesus Christ. Apocalypse means unveiling. It means to reveal. You know, Elon Musk's uh, Tesla truck, when that was unveiled, first of all, there was only chatter about it, only words about it, only discussions about it, but you truly saw it for what it was when it was revealed, when it was unveiled. And Revelation reveals and unveils Jesus Christ unlike any other book in the Bible. 
You know what my prayer is for you today and throughout the next 12 weeks of this series? That there would be an apocalypse of Jesus Christ in your hearts. An apocalypse, a revealing, an unveiling of Jesus Christ unlike you've ever seen him. Revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ. So the context here is, is the letter is written by John. John was one of Jesus' 12 disciples, also known as the Apostle John. He was one of Jesus' inner three, Peter, James, John. All the other disciples have been killed for their faith. They've been martyred. Only John remains, and he's exiled here to this island called Patmos. It's, it's somewhere in the reigns of, of Emperor Nero or the Emperor Domitian where they were absolutely slaughtering Christians. Nero would impale Christians on a pole, set them on fire to light his garden. And they were also being persecuted socially, economically, politically. All kinds of threats were coming to them. So John pens this letter to encourage them, to bring them hope, to, to fill them with courage, to give them eternal perspective to, in how to see their suffering and the threats that were coming at them. So the end times, what do we make then of the end times? Here's the thing. If you get focused on the pieces, you will experience some measure of fear or concern or worry. The mark of the beast, uh, uh, tribulation, and, and you have pastors and churches that will focus on the pieces. And no wonder. But here's the thing. The closer you are to Jesus, the less fear you're going to have about the end times. And anything else that might haunt you or, or alarmism that can happen in our culture today. The closer you are to Jesus. So why am I doing this series? I've, I've been asked that. And even my kids are like, well, what's going on with Revelation? Are the end times? Jesus coming back? And... And I love that. And we're going to get there. But let me tell you why. Uh, one, of, one of the reasons, one of the major reasons I was led to preach a series on Revelation was because of this. There seems to be a movement right now where all the focus is on the end times and Jesus' is second string. And no wonder. If Jesus goes second string and the focus becomes on the end times, of course there's people going to be building bunkers like Mark Zuckerberg for Facebook, all right? You're going to be looking to build bunkers in your life somewhere because it's all ending. No, it's, it, it's, it, Jesus is, is, is it. He's the point of it all. He's the picture on the box. He is to be the focus in all about him. Now, the end peace times matter too. So let me just say that. The end times even Jesus said in Matthew chapter 16 that Christians should be on the lookout and recognizing the signs of the times. Absolutely. We should be. And we should be concerned pieces, right? We should be concerned about Gog and Magog and what is that and the, the mark of the beast. And oh my goodness, is it, is it happening right now? Do I have the mark of the beast? And all of that. We get so concerned. And that does matter, in a sense, for our lives. But still, we got to remember that it, it's to be anchored in, in Jesus. You know, because people will say, yeah, yeah, Jesus, Jesus. But Israel, pastor. Well, no, no, let's back off. Let's talk about Jesus. But at the same time, Israel matters, and, and the tribulation matters, and all this matters. And, and so John, after setting the introduction that it's all about Jesus, does go on to say this, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. So that, that phrase, the word of God, this is the scriptures that John had in that day. Often it refers to the Old Testament. But now John has not only the Old Testament, he has a lot of the New Testament. He has the writings of Paul, which we have. He has the writings of Peter, which we have. Most likely the writings of, of James, which we have. So he's talking about what we have, the word of God and the testimony of Christ and who he is and who he is to be for us and in the times to come. 
So the message goes from the Father to the Son to the angel to John to us. It says that these things must soon take place. Now, it doesn't mean soon in the sense it could happen today. I mean, it could happen today. But what he's talking about, that word soon, is where we get the word tachometer. A tachometer is like a tool in which you measure wind velocity, wind speed. Speed is what it's about. In other words, when the end times begin to unfold, whenever that is, it's going to hit and it's going to go fast. Things are going to unfold fast. So that means if anybody's ever sitting around and going, well, when these things really start to happen and matching up with scripture, I'll get serious about God. No, it's going to be too late for that because things are going to be moving fast. You know, even my kids have asked me, it seems like, you know, the last days and Jesus is coming back. That's been going on for forever. And, and even Second Peter talks about that. Peter writes that we shouldn't count it slow, that God's being slow and coming because he's wanting for everybody to repent. And if you think about it, he's not really tarrying in the sense of one day is a thousand years to God and a thousand years is one day. So literally Jesus just rose from the grave two days ago. So he's holding back, hoping we would repent, you would repent and turn to Christ. He says that he comes to show these things. Interesting that it's not to tell things, it's to show things. Show things which we see in scripture are symbols, lampstands, bowls, trumpets, the beast, and horns. And then there are all these sevens throughout Revelation. Seven has to do with the number of heaven. Like seven, uh, it means complete and whole and perfect, like this. There are seven references to the Messiah Christ. There are seven references to Christ's coming. There are seven amens, seven references to prophets, seven references to the Lord God Almighty, seven references of one who sits on the throne, seven churches, seven letters, seven lampstands, seven seals, seven bowls. I'll stop there. And just for fun, how about this one? The earth represents four, like the four corners of the earth. And you see in Revelation, it takes seven in the four corners of the earth and multiply them. What do you get? Four sevens, which is what? 28. The Lamb of God is mentioned 28 times in the book of Revelation, showing that Christ is all who connects to earth and will return once again. So this is all the story unfolding for us as he shows these things. And he shows these things to his servants. Now listen. His servants. His servants are those who are born again and those who have surrendered themselves to place faith in Christ and now surrendered to follow him and to obey him in all their lives. So here's the thing. Unless you're born again, unless you have surrendered your soul and your life to Christ, revelation will not make sense to you ever. Now, sure, you're going to have some intellectual kind of information. You may know more about end times than Christians do. But here's the thing. It'll never go from your head to your soul. Only his servants, those born again, his children, those who follow him, will truly glean and know the fullness of what God has in his word for our lives. So that's a big question I can ask you even now. Are you born again? Are you fully surrendered to Christ in your life? Because it's all about him. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. And blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it. For the time is near. I love that word blessed. And we are blessed today because there's a reading you're hearing And hopefully we're going to be keeping. So if you're here today, aren't you glad you didn't sleep in? Because if you slept in, you wouldn't be blessed today. You wouldn't hear the reading of Revelation. And I'm so glad I get to preach today because I get to read it to you. And then I hope we leave here today all keeping it together so that we're blessed. The word blessed literally means to be envied, to be happy. So the Lord wants us to be happy, joyful, and have such an apocalypse of Jesus Christ in our hearts that gives us this peace that we will be envied by people in these crazy days because they won't understand where this peace is coming from, where this calmness is in which we live our lives. was well, because Jesus is all. He's the focus of our hearts, our lives. So the closer you are to Jesus, the less fear and troubled hearts you will have. Also, we are to keep his word Keep means obedience in hearing it. 
It means it goes from the head transformation to the heart transformation. And you know you truly love Jesus. You know there has been an apocalypse of Jesus in your heart when you obey his word and obey what you don't like. That's when you know you're surrendered and his Holy Spirit moving and talking. So we're to take it to heart. We're to keep it. So keeping it, applying it, I'm going to do my best to take this book with all these symbols and imagery and try to apply it to your life on what it means Monday morning and how you are to live your life in light of it. But I can't do that well enough. I can't keep it for you. So you are the ones who are going to have to keep it. You're the ones, you've got to get loaded up on some caffeine when we joined here together, where you can hear it and figure out how can I apply this to my own life. I don't want to depend on the pastor to spoon feed this to my life. No, I want to go there. How do I apply this to my life in real time? How is this going to affect my relationships, my marriage, how I... What I do with my money, how I look at my worth or value, how I look at my future, how I deal with my life right now, how will I apply this? Those are the questions you've got to ask about your own soul. You know, something else about the end times in terms of what it it does to our lives, and I had some people I knew in seminary like this, don't let it be Christian that you are so well versed on the end times, but your life is a mess. Because I've known people like that. You are so versed on the Bible, and you can argue the end times with anyone, but your attitude is, is lousy, and you're so angry. To have the Holy Spirit in you, there should be what's called the fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. That's what people who know the end times ought to be living like, the fruit of the Spirit. So let it be so for your life. John continues, verse 4. Now, more introduction. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is, who was, who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Think about this. This is John. He's writing from a rock island, Patmos. He's isolated. He's alone. And in that place where he is isolated and alone, he receives revelation, unlike he's ever known. Boy, isn't that hope? Anybody here feel exiled in a sense in your life, isolated, alone? Do you know it could be that place in isolation where God in Christ gives you the greatest revelation of himself? That's why when you're alone, don't put your Bible to the side. Pick up your Bible and hold it dear. Get into the Bible so that God might use his Holy Spirit to reveal himself in ways in which you've never known. It happened with John. It could happen with you, according to the scriptures. It talks about from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Well, who is that? Most commentators believe it's a reference to the Holy Spirit. I believe this is right because the English has a hard time capturing the Greek in which the New Testament was written. It means the Holy Spirit at the throne of God. And in the Old Testament, we see the Holy Spirit has what's called the seven manifold works of the Holy Spirit. That's what it alludes to, whole other sermon. But he goes on to say, this is him who is, who was, who is to come. This is a God with no beginning and no end. Just ponder for a moment. I remember as a kid trying to do that, just trying to think a being with no beginning and no end. It is, I think we're going to, for those born again in Christ who will go to heaven forever, we're going to be plumbing the depths of that reality forever and be in awe and joy of our God who is such a God. He's faithful in the is now because he's faithful in the was then. And he'll be faithful in what's to come. He's saying to God's people and he's saying to you today, he's going to be faithful to you right now in the is, just like he was faithful in your was. And you can trust him in what's to come. Just let that apocalypse of Jesus take deeper, deeper root in your heart. Also, this is written to the seven churches. This is what jumped out at me this week. It's not written to the seven nations. It's not written to seven hospitals. It's not written to seven universities. It's written to seven churches, which means the church is the most important entity on planet Earth. 
you are a part of something right now, supernatural. This is who God talks to, his church. The Holy Spirit speaks to his people. That's why uh, he goes on to say, that in speaking to us, we can know him because of the church. The church is the non-negotiable. And then verse 5, we see Jesus' apocalyptic apocalypse unveiled even more. John setting the stage, keeping us there. It's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. He's the picture on the box. Focus on him. Verse 5, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Three titles of Jesus. Witness, faithful witness, firstborn of the dead, ruler of the kings of the earth. This would have stirred hope in God's people, in which I hope it would do with you. First of all, he's the faithful witness. We see God in Christ, Christ Jesus, the witness, all through the letter of Hebrews alone. We see that when Jesus came, sinless, he sympathized with our weaknesses. So when we are weak, Jesus witnessed that he's with us in our weaknesses. He'll give us strength. Also, we see in just Hebrews alone that Jesus was tempted in every way which you and I are tempted, yet he was without sin. So he sympathizes in where we are tempted, and we can find strength to get past those temptations. And also, we realize in Hebrews alone that Jesus is one and only. Only through Christ are you given access to the heart and the lap of God. No other religion, no other spirituality. It's all about Jesus. He's the faithful witness because he's the firstborn of the dead. He rose from the grave. He's the one who rose and remained alive forevermore. Jesus raised people from the grave in the New Testament, but they ended up dying again. Jesus is the only one who could raise himself up from the grave and remain alive forevermore. He's Jesus Christ, the apocalyptic one who's given himself to you and to us as salvation to God, making the way right with him so we can have peace with God. And also, he is the ruler of the kings of the earth. This would have given God's people in that day such assurance that the, the justice of God truly will come in his time because the rulers of the earth in those days was slaughtering them, persecuting them socially, economically, politically, the whole thing. So for them to read a letter where John says, in his loneliness and in his isolation, that God rules, Jesus rules over all, it would have given them such hope because all rulers of the earth are on a leash. Therefore, you don't have to fear election outcomes. God's got it. Everything's moving according to plan. Jesus has all authority as, as this world and history begins to wrap itself up in due time to what God has for it. Jesus holds the keys to death, to Hades, hell, the seen and unseen world. He's all powerful. That's who he is. And then also we see there are three things Jesus has done for you if you're born again in Christ. Revelation 1, 5, and 6, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. What a word about Jesus. Notice that first phrase there, to him who loves us. I just have this picture in my mind that John was sitting near a rock. Somehow he had some uh, papyrus stuff to write on. And as he was penning this letter, I just have this image to him writing, to him who loves us, and him stopping right there. And a lump forming in his throat. And tears beginning to well up in his eyes. And him going, I'm loved. I'm loved. My experience is bad, but I'm loved. Do you need to hear that today? You're loved to him who loves you. And this is the same John who wrote another letter, 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, that says, This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and gave his son as the atoning sacrifice for our sins. That's how you get through your loneliness too. That's how you get through brokenness and isolation as well. You go to God's word, what's written for you. Loved, loved. To him who loves us. And that word loves is in a present tense. And what that means is this, that the Lord loves you as intensely and as passionately now than the day when he died on a cross for you. He loves you as intensely and as passionately now as the day you felt his love and were born again. 
It never stops. It's present and forever. You're loved today. Maybe that's the whole, maybe that's the one thing you gotta, you're going to get out of today, and that's enough. You're loved. You're loved. But then he goes on to say, he has freed us by his blood. That word freed literally means there was a ransom paid. You were a prisoner, and something was paid, and you were freed. And the tense of this word means it happened in the past when you were born again, and it is for all time finished. You don't have to keep receiving payment. You've already been freed. Freed in, in, from sin's penalty and sin's power. Sin's penalty, what separated you from God forever. Doomed, unless he did something, and he did in Christ. Freed from sin's power. You have now the Holy Spirit, the resurrection power of Jesus who lives in you. And when you grow closer and closer to him and more and more apocalypse of him in your heart, the greater victory you will have over sin's power. The greater victory you will have over the destruction and disintegration of sin. You have power to say no to sin and power to say yes to Christ because he's freed you by his blood. When Jesus died on the cross, he said, it is finished, paid in full. You're free when you're born again. Have you lost that Christian in your life? The, all of that, the miracle of what he's done for you in that place, you are free, free from shame and guilt in your past. You are free, man. And not only free, Jesus put it this way, not only you're free, you're free indeed. There's a difference between free and free indeed. It's like a pastor put it this way one time. There's a, say there's a criminal. A criminal is in prison. The criminal escapes, but he's not really free because the criminal who escaped has to keep looking over his shoulder and running for his life. No, the criminal who's free is the criminal who's been pardoned. And we've been pardoned in Christ, never to look back at our past and our shame and guilt ever again. What a miracle. What a joy we should have in Christ. And this is why it's all about him. Because he's loved you, he's freed you, and he makes you. He makes you a priest in the sense to God, to your God and Father. We often get caught up on what Jesus has saved us from, sin, and not a lot about what Jesus has saved us for. And that's to be priests, ministers to him, worshiping him. You were built and created to worship God. But we sell out by worshiping our jobs or worshiping our kids or worshiping ourselves. We're built and made to worship. And how has that worship worked for you? No, we're built to worship him. And when we're saved, we find what we're built for, what we're made for, the meaning we've longed for. And you can also use priests. Priests were the only ones who had access to God. And so now you and I have access through Christ to God. Priest, another way of understanding priests is children. We're made the children of God. We have access to his heart and to his lap as father, like children. I think it was Tim Keller who said this. He said, only a child can wake up a king at 3 a.m. and ask for a cup of water and get away with it. And that's who we are in Christ. We've been made for this. And then you put it all together John gets to this moment, and he just, I think he just kind of throws the pen up in the air and stands up with his hands raised in this praise of God that reads this way, to him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This is called a, it's called a doxology. A doxology is something you say to give glory to God. And there are doxologies, these kind of statements all throughout Revelation. Oh, by the way, guess how many doxologies are in Revelation? Seven. We're in, yeah, all right, we're all aboard together. And this is the shortest one, meaning he's just getting warmed up. And hopefully we are too. Forever and ever, amen. I, I, I don't know if this makes sense for everybody, but in sports, especially in basketball right now, there's this thing where you know, an athlete scores and overpowers the opponent. And I think of Austin Reeves for the Lakers years ago. He made this move and he starts running down the court, hitting his chest like this, going, I'm him. I'm him. And then now you see a lot of these athletes. I know one has got him tattooed on his wrist. And I've been thinking about that. You know, him. Him meaning uh, you can't stop me. Him in that I'm an unstoppable force. Listen, y'all. Jesus is him. He's the point of it all. All the pieces point to him. Him. It's him. 
Now he lands it with him and, and be praised to him forever and ever, amen. And I would think that's now when I close up my Bible, pray and we go home. But he can't help himself. He can't stop, so he keeps going. Verse seven, behold, he is coming on the clouds or with the clouds and every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. And Revelation, the rest of Revelation, pretty much unpacks that one verse right there. Notice he says, behold. He's saying, let this stir you. Let this encourage you. Let this compel you to be born again if you're not. And then to surrender your life and to follow Jesus because he's coming with the clouds. That can really literally say he's coming on the clouds. In Mark chapter 14 and Matthew chapter 26, Jesus himself says, I am coming back on the clouds in his second coming. So this can get a little confusing. There's the second coming of Jesus, but then there's the rapture of Jesus. So the first coming is when Jesus came as, a, as the babe, and then he died on the cross and was resurrected and ascended. The next coming is not the second coming. The next coming is the rapture. So the rapture is this. The rapture is when Jesus comes back in the clouds, and those on the earth in that moment who are dead in Christ will rise, and those who remain will ascend to meet Jesus in the clouds. That's the rapture. The second coming is when we come with Jesus on the clouds. In the rapture, only believers will see him. In the second coming, all people will see him. And I hope you're the ones in the rapture, not on, not on the earth in the second coming. But this is what he's saying. He's coming on the clouds, on the clouds. And then every eye will see him. I don't know what that means. I don't know if it's like social media, every eye will see him. I don't know if it's a, an unveiling over a 24-hour period that all will see him. I, I don't know if it's like a lightning strike, something supernatural, and all will see him. It's kind of fun to, what, it, what could that be? We don't know. Even, this, even those who pierce him will see him. Now, that's interesting that John just kind of dropped that in there. It doesn't really match with all the other things he's saying. He drops in even those who pierced him because John still has a horror of seeing Jesus crucified on the cross, those who pierced him. And by the way, we're all guilty of piercing him. Zechariah, the Old Testament, points to that. We're all guilty. That's why we can be relieved of guilt and shame when we're born again and and have placed our faith in Jesus and been pardoned to be right with him. It says they will wail on account of him. Wail means they will beat their breast, wailing on account of him. Some in repentance, most in rage. This is one of the, all my years of being a Christian and pastor, the one thing that's always struck me throughout Revelation is when cataclysm actually begins to happen, catastrophe by God begins to happen and humanity there on the earth realize it's God that's unveiling, releasing this cataclysm and catastrophe, I would think anybody on the earth in that day would go, oh my, it is God. He's true to his word and you drop to your knees and you repent. Nope. What you see on repeat every time is those who remained still did not repent. It is as if they got angrier at God. So beware if anybody has thinking like, wow, when that kind of stuff begins to happen, then I believe. No, you won't. You're probably going to get angrier or angry and reject him even more. They will wail on account of him. And it says, even so, amen. Now, this is fun. The even so, amen, written here in the original language the New Testament is written in Greek, the Old Testament in Hebrew. So what John does here in his letter is this. The words, even so, is in Greek, but he writes amen in Hebrew. What is he after here? Well, even so in Greek means yes, absolutely. The word amen in Hebrew means certain. So what he just did here is say this. It is absolutely certain that things are going to go down just like that. God is true to his word. Jesus is coming again. He's him. Now, I would think he just said, did he? Yep, he just said amen again. So we're done. Nope, he still can't help himself. So he drops the mic right here, mic drop. 
I am the Alpha, Jesus says. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The Alpha, the Omega. That's the first letter and the last letter of the Greek alphabet. It's our A to Z. So what is he saying? Here's what he's saying, y'all. Jesus is all the letters. He's almighty. He's all powerful. He's all wise. He's all true. He's the picture on the box. He's the focus of it all. Yeah. And he says that he is almighty. The, the word for that is Shaddai. It means God in his strength. And you're invited to experience his strength as there's more and more of an apocalypse in you to him. So what do we say here at the end? Here's what I say. What else and who else is there to live for? Who else? All pieces point to him. It's all about him. He's him, but is he him to you? Let's pray together. So I'm going to do something I haven't done in over a year or more. I've lost track. And I'm speaking to this room, Middletown, I'm talking to you today. Newburgh, this is for you. Port Jervis, for you. Warwick, I'm talking to you today. Also online, talking to you, and then right here in this room at Washingtonville, all, all under the sound of my voice. I'm compelled, maybe through this whole series, but especially today, I've been so compelled all week to offer a moment for you to believe in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior to be born again today. Everybody on the sound of my voice watching this right now from our locations in this room, this is, and here's why. You just heard in an introduction from John, the revelation of Jesus Christ, meaning this, you may never hear a revelation about Jesus like this ever again. This is your moment. So what I want to do is offer you a, an opportunity to publicly embrace Jesus as your Lord and Savior born again. And this is, for, this is for the first time. This is not like a recommitment of your life. This is for those for the first time you haven't believed. In a day you're saying, I'm placing my faith in Jesus, knowing that he lived, he died for my sin, he rose again, he is coming back. And through my faith in him that I cannot save myself, I'm not good enough, but I'm also not bad enough, that he saves me in it all, and I'm, through him I am made right with God and his child, set free, pardoned forever. Boy. Who else and what else is there to live for? So this opportunity is for you in just a moment. I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand and this will just be between you and me and then right there, I wanna invite the lead pastors there at the campuses. Leads, if you'll go ahead and just kind of walk up to, your, to the platform there. So right here in this room and at the other campuses there with your lead pastor and those online, just in a moment, I wanna invite you just to lift your hand between us and in so doing, I want you to picture it like this. The apocalyptic hand of Jesus reaching down for you and you're simply reaching up to take his hand. That's the, that's the symbol of what this could be for you. A moment to never forget. So right now, if there's anyone you're saying today, today, I believe. Today, I'm placing my faith in Jesus. I believe to give him my life and to follow him with all my heart. If that's you, would you raise your hand right now? Just say, that's me, that's me right here in Washingtonville, Middletown, where you are, go ahead and raise your hand, like taking the hand of Jesus. Warwick, raise that hand high so he can see you there. Newburgh, raise that hand. Poor Jervis, raise that hand high. Right there on online, tap that hand so that's me today. Let your lead pastor see you so we can celebrate with you. And then right here in Washingtonville, lift that hand. Let me see, all over our room, all over the rooms at all of our campuses. To God be praised. To God be praised. Hands high. To God be praised. All over our rooms, to God be praised. Grace Community Church, we have new brothers and sisters in Christ today. Mm. Let's pray together. Lord, I, I, all these hands that are raised, thank you for the hands that are raised in Middletown and in Newburgh and Port Jervis and Warwick. 
Thank you for the hands that are raised there online, and thank you for the hands raised here in Washingtonville, Lord, those who have, who have, been, who have been moved from darkness into the kingdom of light. What a miracle. I pray over those who, lay, who lifted their hands, may they sense the miracle of what has happened in their heart today, an apocalypse of Jesus that you have gifted them today. From death to life today. I pray a covering over them. I pray they would grow in you and follow you. I pray you protect them from the enemy's lies and attacks that I'm sure the enemy does not like this today. And so, Lord, may they keep their eye on you. Thank you for our church that loves you, Jesus. And we praise you, Jesus, today. You are worthy and you are worth it all, Jesus. To you be the glory. Hear our song now to you. In Jesus' name I pray. We all said amen. amen.